Okay, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. And uh, let's pray before we start. Lord God, thank you so much for being with us through the day. Thank you for keeping us safe, for bringing us together. And we bless you for your word and for your faithfulness to us. Father, would you please wash us clean from the things of the day? Would you please fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, that we will be anointed by you, both in my lips and in our ears. Lord, we want to hear from you. We pray that you would be glorified as we do this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you remember last time, uh, Jesus was on the cross and he just died. Um, and we saw how Jesus chose when to die. Uh, he, he wasn't killed. He chose when to die. And he knew that his work on earth was completed. We saw how he went through horrendous suffering for us and for our salvation. And as Christians, we will literally be eternally grateful to him for doing that. And I think that gratitude should be evident in our lives each day as we serve and as we live for Jesus in preparation for our eternal future as his bride. God's holiness demanded Jesus' death on our behalf, because as the scriptures teach, the wages of sin is death. And although our passage today starts in verse 38, to give context, I'm going to start at verse 37. Uh, if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we'll be looking at uh, verses 37 to 41. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that, he cried out like this and breathed out, so that he cried out like this and breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph and Salome, who followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So when Jesus died, several things occurred, and they all have meaning. First, we read that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Mark doesn't mention it, but uh, Matthew tells us that a great, er great earthquake occurred as well, and that was one of the things that happened as Jesus died. Matthew also says that many believers in their tombs were raised to life. But we're in Mark tonight, so I'll come back to Mark. And he does mention the veil of the temple. And uh, But what's so important about that? This veil was 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, and about four inches thick. It was big. It separated the holy place in the temple from the most holy place. And the priests who carried out their temple ministry would do so in the holy place. But the most holy place, or the holy of holies, was the area where God was considered to dwell. Uh, because in the first temple, that was where the Ark of the Covenant would sit with its mercy seat, and the glory of God would dwell continually there. However, in the second temple that was standing when Jesus was around, uh, there was no Ark of the Covenant but it was still considered to be the place of God's presence. And only the high priest was allowed into that area, and that it was only once a year on the Day of Atonement. And even he could only enter when he carried blood from a sacrificed animal, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people. And if the high priest's sacrifice was not accepted by God, then the expectation was that God would strike the high priest dead. And the veil marked the separation of God from the people because of the barrier of sin that has broken the relationship of God with mankind. So it was a very symbolic, very important veil. And the size and the thickness of the veil would make it impossible for man to tear the material. It was so strong and so thick, it would take much more than a type of war to pull it apart, much more. Uh, but even if that proved possible, it would have been torn from the bottom up. But Mark tells us it was torn from top to bottom. 
it was God doing it. And in so doing, he was making clear that the barrier between him and man had been done away with. And that's such good news, isn't it? Mm. The means of that barrier being removed was the death of Jesus as our substitute. He has made the way to God possible again. But that way is only effective in response to our personal faith and our trust in Jesus' death on our behalf. The word that Mark used for torn, talking about the veil, is the Greek word schizo, from which we derive our word schism, or schizophrenic, I guess, as well. Mark used it at the beginning of the Gospel. Next slide, please. Um, and at Jesus' baptism, he used it, uh, it was when he used it. Mark chapter 1, verse 10, which says, And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting, and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. And there it's translated as the word parting. And it's saying that the heavens were torn open to allow the Holy Spirit to descend as a dove. So on both occasions that Mark used the word, there was the revelation of deity. The first time it was the official launch of Jesus' ministry on earth, when he was endorsed as God's son. And then the other time at the crucifixion, God was again endorsing his son because what Jesus had done on the cross had made access to God possible again for mankind. And what's also important to note, I think we saw it last time, is that Jesus died at three o'clock in the afternoon as the true Passover lamb. And that was the time of the official Passover sacrifice was made by the priests in the temple. And imagine the horror of the Jewish leaders as the temple that marked uh, the barrier preventing access into God's presence was torn from top to bottom. They would have been in the temple. And the tearing of the veil signified the end of the mosaic system of temple worship, because now, of course, we have access through Christ. Mm. And the writer of Hebrews commented on this, setting out the system uh, situation in Hebrews 9, verses uh, 7 to 8. But into the second part of the, the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. So it's, it's just drawing attention to that situation that now we can go, whereas it couldn't before. Uh, and then the writer to Hebrews also goes on then to discuss the outcome of Jesus' death in chapter 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest, the holy, the holy, most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Jesus is now our high priest and he's made possible our much needed access to Almighty God. It, it really is a wonderful truth that we should never take for granted. And one, one other facet of the torn veil is interesting, is if a Jewish father lost his firstborn son, he would tear his robe as a sign of his grief. Mm -hmm. And the torn veil that occurred as Jesus died picked up this practice as God the Father tore his robe, the veil, to his presence in the temple. It was a very powerful, but what a glorious statement to those in the temple for the Passover sacrifice. It's now done away with. Hallelujah. And there is a rabbinic tradition mentioned in the Talmud concerning the year 40 years before the destruction of the temple. We know the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So this brings us back to 30 AD, which many people believe was the, the, the year of Jesus' crucifixion. And this tradition says that the Western light went out, this referring to the central light on the menorah standing in the first room of the temple. I mean, in other words, the holy place. That light symbolized God's presence and his blessing, but it mysteriously kept going out after 30 AD. And in the Jewish mind, that indicated that God had departed 
And as we know, the need for the temple was no longer required once Jesus, who was prefigured in the temple, had died and then risen, enabling any true believer to come into God's presence wherever they are. No further temple sacrifices were then needed. It's an amazing truth. <clears throat> so let's move on to the next event following Jesus' death, and that's the, the, the reaction of the centurion. That's in verse 39. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. And this centurion would have been the Gentile Roman officer in charge of the crucifixion. And he would be accountable to Pilate to make sure it was done. He saw the way that Jesus died and he would have been very aware of the earthquake that occurred. And he would have seen the three hours of darkness that overwhelmed the Middle East during the last part of Jesus' time on the cross. He would have seen the confession of one of the two criminals on the cross. And he had heard Jesus' response that the man would be with Jesus in paradise that day. That centurion would have seen numerous crucifixions. He had seen many other people <laughs> die. But he recognised that something was different about Jesus. And we find his response there in verse 39, truly this man was the son of God. And isn't it somewhat ironic that the Jews who, to whom the Messiah came had failed to recognize the Jewish son of God when he came. But it took a Gentile soldier to see it. And the evidence is there for any genuine seeker after God to see that Jesus is who he claimed to be to be Israel's Messiah and uh, God's own son. And Jesus is truly unique, and he has uniquely provided salvation for whoever will come to him in repentance and faith, trusting in his death on the cross as sufficient to make us acceptable to God. In addition, there were several women who looked on from a distance. I think it's, it's interesting that none of the, the Gospels record any woman opposing or resisting the ministry of Jesus. And that gives it a, a challenge to us men, doesn't it? Uh, and Mark names some of the women there. You've got Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome, who was the sister of Jesus' mother. And we know from other gospels that Mary, Jesus' mother, was also present. And these women had no doubt watched the proceedings of that day. They had seen the taunting, the jeering, the soldiers mocking and casting lots for Jesus' clothing. They had seen the responses of the two other men being crucified with Jesus. They had seen the thick darkness that had come over the land and they had seen Jesus give up his life and die. What they didn't know at that stage was that three days later, Jesus would be back very much alive, encouraging and instructing the believers and showing many people that he had conquered death. When the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that she would give birth to Jesus, he also made the comment, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Mm. And even when things look black and hopeless, as it must have done to those ladies then, we should remember that nothing is impossible for God. Don't let your faith, or the lack of it, limit what God wants to do. One of the things that would have seemed hopeless to these women was what would happen to Jesus' body. It was normal practice for the bodies of those who had been crucified to be thrown into the valley of Hinnom, which was the burning rubbish dump of the city. The Jewish day would end about 6 p.m. or but perhaps more precisely when three stars were visible in the sky. And this particular day was followed by a Sabbath. So if Jesus' body was to be salvaged from burning in the valley of Hinnom, then it had to be taken down from the cross quickly and the following things done. First, it needed to be requested by the victim's relative. Second, it had to be properly wrapped and prepared for burial according to custom. And third, it had then had to be buried either in the family graveyard or a tomb. We know that Jesus' mother and aunt were present and also his cousin John, but other than John, no men were currently present to help Jesus to help remove Jesus' body off the cross. And there was no tomb that was at that point made available. 
And yet, as we'll now see, God provided for their needs in the most wonderful way. Um, and we should note also that under Roman law, the release of a crucified man's corpse for burial was determined only by the imperial magistrate, who would have been pilot. Usually such a request by a victim's relatives was granted, but sometimes a body was left on the cross to decay or be eaten by birds mm. or predatory animals, I guess as a warning to others. So we get the solution as in the last chunk of the chapter in verses 42 to 47. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the, in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. <clears throat> and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. God prompted Joseph of Arimathea to step in and ask Pilate for Jesus' body. He knew of the regulations under both Roman and Jewish law, so he went to Pilate and requested the release of Jesus' body. Possibly his prominent position and his wealth caused Pilate to regard him favourably. Uh, we see in verse 44 that Pilate was amazed that Jesus was already dead, given that crucifixion is normally a slow process. And that reminds us again that Jesus chose when to die, at the exact time that the official Passover sacrifice was being made. In addition to him, uh, we learn from John 19, 38 to 40, that Nicodemus assisted him. It says, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he went, so he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. That's weight, not money. And then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. And all that we know of Nicodemus biblically is from John's Gospel. So if you want to know about Nicodemus, that's where you go. Both of these men, men were prominent members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council. Both were very wealthy, and it seems almost certain that they had agreed to do this beforehand because time was of the essence in taking Jesus from the cross and putting him in a grave before the end of the day. Both men were secret believers that Jesus was, and of course is, still the Messiah. And given that a quorum of only 23 men was needed to pass a death penalty resolution in the Sanhedrin, I think it's almost certain that neither Joseph nor Nicodemus were present at Jesus' Jewish trials, because they would surely not have given their consent. In fact, Luke 23, 51, explicitly confirms that Joseph had not consented to Jesus' death. And in Luke 23, 53, Luke describes uh, Joseph as a good and righteous man. And Mark notes in verse 43 that Joseph took courage in approaching Pilate. Pilate checked with the centurion that Jesus was dead and in the process received confirmation from an experienced Roman official that death had taken place and the body would never have been released by Pilate otherwise. And I think almost certainly the prominence of Joseph's standing in society, plus his great wealth, would mean that he was known to Pilate. However, by declaring his allegiance to Jesus, Joseph and then also Nicodemus were putting the reputation very much on the line. And there were four reasons why they were putting their reputation on the line. One, he was not related to Jesus, so there was no obligation on Pilate to release the body to him. And that made his request even more bold. Two, his request could well have been denied, as Jesus had been executed for treason in Roman eyes. Three, 
he risked ceremonial defilement in handling a dead body, especially so given it was the beginning of Passover. And four, his request amounted to an open confession of personal loyalty to the crucified Jesus. And that would have incurred hostility from most of the other members of the Sanhedrin, certainly from the high priest and his associates. And being such a prominent person, his involvement in caring for the body of Jesus would have attracted a good deal of attention, much of it negative. But what a beautiful example of being bold for Christ, despite the pressures of the culture around you. And what an example that we can learn from that. We should also note that Joseph is described in verse 43 as waiting for the kingdom of God. That would suggest that he was looking expectantly for the coming of the Messiah and the Messianic kingdom. So it would indicate that he was a believer. And in that regard, it seems likely the same would apply to Nicodemus. We know that uh, Nicodemus visited Jesus by night. That was in John 3. He also defended Jesus before the Sanhedrin in John 7. But his involvement in caring for Jesus' body here shows that he must have become a believer. Because the cost to both him and Joseph was enormous. Other historical sources suggest that Nicodemus was the third richest person in Jerusalem at this time. Yet because of his stand for Jesus here, he lost everything and ended his life in poverty. Both Joseph and Nicodemus would have known the Old Testament scriptures, and they knowingly or otherwise, they fulfilled Isaiah 53, verse 9, by giving Jesus a burial in a rich man's tomb. And that verse says, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. And this is one more proof that Jesus is the Messiah, because that prophecy is about him, and he fulfilled it. Perhaps we should take a moment to consider what these two men did for Jesus. First, they were reluctant to stand up for Jesus while he was alive, but their faith came to the fore now, such that they asked for Jesus' body, so that they could give him a decent burial. Then verse 46 of Mark tells us that he, that's Joseph, took the body down from the cross. The very act of doing that would mean that he was ritually defiled, according to Jewish law, and the same would apply to Nicodemus, as he also cared for the body. For two such prominent members of the Jewish council to do that was a huge step to take. And as part of the burial procedure, they would have washed the body prior to wrapping it. Imagine the gory procedure of that, given the extent of Jesus' injuries. Much of Jesus' skin would have been torn from his body by the scourging. There would have been muscles and quite possibly bones exposed. They would have become messy themselves as they wiped away the blood that had been shed for the sins of the world. Nicodemus had brought a hundred pounds in weight of myrrh and aloes, spices that were used in the burial of bodies. That was hugely expensive and it shows Nicodemus's commitment to Jesus by that stage. And they bound the body in strips of linen and it was normal Jewish custom procedure to wrap a body in strips of linen just as an aside, that fact would cast doubt on the Turin Shroud as being genuine because mm. they wrapped in strips from the whole thing. Mm. And then they laid the body in a tomb cut from the rock. And from the other Gospels, we learned that this was a rich man's tomb that had never been used. It was in a private garden, and Matthew tells us that it belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. All of this was done for a dead Jesus. How much more should we give our allegiance to our risen, ever-living Jesus? The tomb was then shut by rolling a large stone down a sloping groove until it was securely in front of the entrance to keep out intruders. And to roll that stone back up again would require the strength of several men. Mark mentions two women who saw where Jesus was laid, so they knew where to come back to in order to finish the job of anointing the body once the Sabbath was over. Matthew gives a bit more detail in Matthew 27, 61, which says, and Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. The fact that they sat opposite, or we could say in front of the tomb, shows that they were, were there for a while. They saw what was going on 
so they were able to make sure that they knew where to come after the Sabbath to attend to the body further. And Luke reinforces that in 23.55 when he says, And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. There was no doubt for them as to which tomb was used, although Jesus only borrowed it for three days. And it's important that the Gospels record that Jesus was buried. As the children have been learning in the Sunday school, it's a central part of the Gospel where it confirms that Jesus truly died. And the burial of Jesus' body was the last act of what theologians call the Messiah's humiliation, indicating that the death of the God-man. This humiliation began with the incarnation of Jesus when he was born, because he took on the likeness of sinful man while being sinless himself. And obviously his arrest, his mocking, torture, and then death were part of that humiliation and uh, linked to his death was his burial. The eternally living one was now in the grave. What a, what a paradox that is. Well, well um, and, and, but it, it, it could be said also, I think, that Jesus' burial was the beginning of his exaltation as well. Because many theologians say the exaltation began at Jesus' resurrection, followed by his ascension, ascension and then his exaltation at God's right hand. But I think it could be argued that by being buried in a rich man's unused tomb, it marked just the first stage of his exaltation. The tomb was in a private garden, whilst many years earlier, in another garden, the Garden of Eden, physical and spiritual death entered the world through Adam's sin. Now Jesus, the last Adam, brought blessing and new life to come by being buried and rising from the dead in a garden. It's a lovely circle being joined up, isn't it? And the importance of the burial is highlighted in uh, as a core part of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 4. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And... We could argue perhaps that the death and resurrection of Jesus are more vital as a part of our salvation. But it's vital that we know that Jesus was buried. He truly did die for us. And of course, then he conquered death by rising again. So today we've seen some amazing things occurring after Jesus' death. There were clear acts of God in the torn curtain in the temple. We know from other Gospels there was an earthquake. Many dead believers were resurrected or resuscitated, really. But we also have seen some tender responses to Jesus' death. The confession of the centurion, the witness of the women, and the loving care of the body by Joseph and Nicodemus. But how do we respond to Jesus' death? It occurred because each one of us is a sinner. And because of that, we desperately need forgiveness from Almighty God, who is utterly holy and righteous. And because of his holy justice, he must judge sin with death, both physically and spiritually. And because he is eternal, that means eternally. However, he has lovingly and graciously given us a substitute who died in our place, his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. We have compelling and I believe convincing evidence that Jesus came as the promised Messiah, that he was sin-free, so he alone is able to satisfy God's holy nature and his death occurred in place of ours. We'll see next time as we finish Mark's gospel that death couldn't hold him, that he rose again exactly as prophesied. And in doing so, we know, we have assurance that he's conquered death for all who will put their trust in him. Every person who has ever lived must give an account of their life to God. And if we've trusted in Jesus for our salvation, God will never count our sins against us. We are then accepted before God, delivered from the judgment that we deserve, and will spend eternity in his presence in the most wonderful place imaginable. It's no wonder we refer to this as good news. But what will you do with that good news that Jesus died for you? Let's pray.
Lord, we thank you so much for these events that we've seen occurred in the aftermath of Jesus' death and before his resurrection. Thank you that there's so much depth and meaning to them. But we also thank you that, you, that the grave couldn't hold Jesus. Thank you that he was our substitute. He is our substitute. Thank you that he was buried because he was dead, which adds so much more meaning to the resurrection. We know that death couldn't hold him and he's alive forevermore. Lord, would you help us here tonight, those who see this online afterwards, help us all to appreciate what Jesus has done for us and to, to live for him, knowing that he is our only saviour. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Mm -hmm.